On to our final witness, uh, Waiwai Nu, uh, Rohingya a Burmese activist uh, who previously come to testify at our hearing. Um, I'm pleased to have her as a witness today. Uh, Waiwai Nu, you may begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Tarko and Vice Chair Cooper and to the whole U.S. Commissions on International Religious Freedom for inviting me to testify before you today. I'm grateful for this opportunity to share my remark alongside my fellow panelists following my participations in the Commission's uh, previous uh, hearing about the U.S. genocide determinations and their potential to prevent atrocities across the world. Through our focus on Burma's religious freedom violations today, I hope that the U.S. will be encouraged to effectively address the uh, ongoing human rights and humanitarian catastrophe in the country. Ethnic and religious minorities in Burma have long believed in the U.S. potential to help bring them justice and accountability. This is because we have been persecuted for decades by being in a country apology. This is because we have been persecuted for decades by being in a country dominated by Buddhism and the Burma ethnic group. The Burmese military manipulated these differences to pit us against each other and justify its brutal attempt to control us by committing war crimes, crimes against humanity, and against Rohingya genocide. Due to these decades of impunity, the Burmese military launched and and have attempted coup over the two years over two years ago, and has since committed more mass atrocities that amount to crimes against humanity and war crimes. According to the Independent Investigative Mechanism for Myanmar and other United Nations and independent expert bodies, ethnic and religious minorities are now facing such atrocities at an escalating level. These include a heightened risk of re recurrence of genocidal attacks against the Rohingya. I myself join you today after facing year of, years of persecutions as a Rohingya and Muslim woman in Burma. Due to my identity, the military imprisoned me and my family as a political prisoner for seven years. My experience as an ethnic and religious minority in Burma and my time with the women detainees have seen fueled my activism to end all forms of injustice in the country. Today, many more members of the pro-democracy movement are risking everything to ensure that Burma's federal democracy will be far from the so-called democratic transitions of the past. We must never forget that during that decade-long period, Rohingya Muslims were denied of citizenship, voting rights, and instead targeted with widespread hate speech, wave of state-sponsored violence, and the military's genocidal attack. While we reflect and change, the Burmese military continue to intensify its brutal practices across the country. Since the attempted coup, the military has intensified its airstrikes and shelling in areas primarily resided by the ethnic and religious minorities, the military is arbitrarily arresting and murdering pastors and other clergy members from the communities such as Chen and Kachin. The military is also destroying churches and convents with heavy weapons in Karen and other areas. After releasing the notorious anti-Muslim monk Wirathu from prison, the military awarded him with an honorary title. The military and its supporters are now spreading hate speech and disinformation against Muslims and Rohingya, as well as women's human rights defenders um, on online platforms such as Facebook, TikTok, and Telegram. The military is also issuing past and new policies to further confine the over 600,000 Rohingya in Burma, who include the over 140,000 uh, in internally displaced person came in Rakhine state. These apartheid-like uh, policies include restrictions on Rohingya's freedom of movement, more requirement for 
for the use of discriminatory national verification card and frequent administrations of suetense or abusive family check-in process. These policies are restricting Rohingyas across uh, Rohingyas access to healthcare, education, mocks, livelihoods, and other basics need. The military is fundamentally using these policies as arbitrary grounds to arrest and detain Rohingya. According to my organization, the Women's Peace Network, the military has arbitrarily arrested at least 2,700 Rohingya since the attempted coup, including over 800 women. The clashes between the military and Arkan army in Rakhine state, despite their so-called ceasefire, will continue to pose life-threatening risks to the Rohingya in Burma. Millions of people in Burma have thus been forced to flee their homes as IDPs and refugees over the past two years. All of them are denied reliable access to basics need, safety and services, as well as, as, well as safety and protection. In Bangladesh and other countries in South and Southeast Asia, over 1 million Rohingya refugees are facing increasing securitization and surveillance from the squalid camp to the Bashangsha Island. Among them, women and children are at particular risks of sexual violence and sexual exploitations from the members of their community and the local authorities. In countries that include in India, Malaysia, Rohingya refugee rigs forced deportation to Burma. None of these communities are granted access to justice uh, mechanisms. These deteriorating conditions, both in Burma and Bangladesh, are leaving Rohingya with no options but to escape by precarious journey that um, endanger them with human trafficking and deadly sea crossing. This was most recently demonstrated in the end of 2022 when hundreds of Rohingya fled by at least 12 boats, one of which carrying 180 people went missing. After these decades of military mass atrocities, it is devastating that the international community is still failing to protect Rohingya and all people in Burma. These delays in bringing justice and accountability to Burma has only emboldened the military to commit more atrocities against us. We feel disappointed because we know that under the US leadership, the international community can have the political will to pursue these actions. We are reminded of this potential in the international community's immediate response to the war in Ukraine. While we appreciate the State Department officials determina official determinations of the Bur Burmese military's atrocities and Rohingya genocide, as well as the Congress passage of the Burma Act, these momentous acts require further measures to end human rights and humanitarian catastrophe in Burma. Therefore, today I, ask, I urge the US to bolster the measures that it has taken with a comprehensive and sustainable strategy beyond ASEAN failed five-point consensus. These measures must address both the short and long-term needs of Rohingya and other ethnic and religious minorities in the country. First, the US government must provide a greater financial and material and technical support to empower ethnic and religious minorities in Burma and those displaced in Bangladesh and other countries in South and Southeast Asia. These assistance should be delivered to these communities, civil societies, especially women's groups and youth groups. Second, the US must implement more measures to protect these ethnic and religious minorities. Such protection mechanisms should include support for the communities, resettlements in third countries over their arrest, detention, and deportation by host countries. These mechanisms should also include actions to hold the Burmese military accountable for its international crimes. Especially the US should curve the military's weapon and financial flows by imposing economic sanctions, in particular, Myanmar oil and gas enterprise, as well as a ban on military's aviation fuel supply. For Rohingya, the US Congress 
should include these measures in a legislation aimed at bringing the communities out of genocide. This is one practical step, a step to effectuate last year's atrocity determinations and to file a major shortcoming of the Burma Act. These uh, to fill the major shortcoming of the Burma Act. This legislation should ensure that the US uh, coordination with the governments in ASEAN and other countries to deploy search and rescue missions for the Rohingya stranded on the boat in the respective jurisdiction. This should also include measures for the Rohingya in the period after the attempted coup. These measures should involve the US support for an effective transitional justice processes uh, for Rohingya's justice, repatriation, uh, reparations, reconciliations, and re rehabilitations in the country. As Secretary Blinken shared in his speech when announcing the genocide determination, I quote, ultimately the path out of genocide also lead homes, quote, a safe, dignified, and voluntary return to their ancestral home in Arkan, Burma is what the Rohingya community needed and wants the most. In this context, U.S. must also support the Burmese political leaderships in their effort to protect religious freedom and beliefs in our federal democratic future. These processes should no longer repeat the Burma's historical patterns of excluding Rohingya and Muslims. The National Unity Government and the National Unity Consultative Council should thus effectively involve these groups in their governance, administration, and leaderships. Special measures to protect the identity and existence of Rohingya, such as by granting them a protected status in Burma's federal democratic future, should be also considered. Lastly, the US must lead the way for the international community to meaningfully engage with the ethnic and religious minorities, especially women and youth, in all discussions and mechanisms about, about Burma's federal democratic future. Over the past two years, since the Burmese military's attempted coup and after decades of its atrocities, the US should not betray our, people hope, our people's hope for justice, democracy, and freedom. Only through acting for these values and ending impunity in Burma can Rohingya and other ethnic and religious minorities finally live in peace and harmony. Thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for your time, and I look forward to your question. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank all of our witnesses. Now we're going to move on to the, uh, the Q&A session. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Commissioner of 